I have never played League of Legends. I have a girlfriend. But Arcane, the Netflix show? Very deservedly earned their game award, fighting for the top spot of best video game adaptation of all time. And it has a bit of that Spider-Verse flair with where there are so many micro details to be picked from every frame. And we'll be picking apart what I consider to be the scene that changed Arcane, the best scene, the climax in the middle, and the part that actually narratively puts the whole timeline of events through a loop. It's of course the fall and rise of our titular character Jinx. She may not be the protagonist, but she's certainly the central figure. And this so-called scene is actually a 22 minute sequence. This project is really pushing me to my limits of definitions, and there's like five different character arcs reaching their culminating point here. So we're gonna take some liberties and skin through certain details as we go. All right, let's get into it. <sighs> wow. I must say the artistic aesthetic of Arcane is one that's just gotta be one of my favorites. I mean, God, look at it. Look at this rooftop locale. I sure do wish nothing bad happens to this idyllic place. So for some establishing context, we have this ragtag group of kids, Vi, Milo, Clagger, and Powder, each on a mission to save their fatherish figure, Vander, who's been kidnapped by the villain of our story, Silco. And in the moments leading up to the operation, Powder has been instructed with the commands to You're not coming. I'm not afraid. It's too dangerous. I can help! You're not ready! She's been left behind. Now the actual nature of most of the mission we're actually gonna skim, as we're just focusing on Jinx contributions to the whole sequence. And at the same time of these scenes, we also have our B plot of some scientists trying to work out the functionalities of a hex core. I'll spare you these moments too, as much as Victor is my favorite character. So the next time we see anything is with Powder once again, as she's crying to herself in her bedroom. <laughs> And more so than that, she is lashing out. From previous interactions, we've come to learn that she's insecure over Milo's bullying of her, calling her a jinx for ruining missions for the rest of them. And clearly, being told to stay back is only contributing to her worries even more. And what's more, this seems to be more than your usual childhood freakout, with the sound design of this scene coming in with some intrusive audio work. From the diegetic sounds of the toy monkey clapping incessantly without a head, to the scratchy violin soundtrack seemingly almost emblematic of something mental going on, like an irritated sound is playing to powder from the inside. It's just an insinuation so far, but perhaps shows that the signs of some sort of psychological disorder were present even before her defining moment. As we'll come to see later on down the timeline, she has full-on hallucinatory episodes visually and audibly. Or it's just some foreshadowing baked into the sound design. I'm not a therapist. I can help them. But as she has her moment, eventually she comes to a practical solution, finally making herself useful and able to contest her deepest insecurities with a dash of optimistic innocence too. And so the mission takes place. The hex core also explodes, but don't worry about that scene. As the gang of teens reach Vander tied to a chair and begin to release him, Milo lockpicking and Klagor tackling an exit route through the wall. All the while, Silco and his gang have made their appearance to corner and kill them now they've gathered to their trap. Meanwhile, Powder has just about caught up, appearing from a big dark tunnel, the start and end point of our sequence. Also, while looking up at the target building, the camera is tilting diagonally for that great sense of unease. The music is foreboding as the weather is too gloomy and unwelcoming. Her sister Vi at this time is prepping for her character arc, choosing to stand up against her opposition no matter the figure. Armed with metal fists, she's ready to throw some hands, as Powder catches a glance and continues upwards. This one's just for function, so I'll skip these function-only shots going forwards. Gotta crunch down these numbers somehow, we're tackling more than 50% of a 40 minute episode here. And so the fight actually begins. A stare down of faces, a deflect of the knife, and a slow-mo uppercut. <laughs> This weapon is intense and Vi can hold her own. And she does so as more and more goons come for her one by one. We love some frenetic choreography. It's a moment of drama for everyone involved as Powder gets a near miss against Milo's lockpick fumblings. But as the gang make progress, everyone finding a bit of their stride, so too does Powder finally reaching her window. A glow of optimism against the dark backdrop or it's just the source of all the happenings this evening. 
if you forget the hex call. We're skipping the hex call scene, okay? Now there's another beat to this fisticuff exchange. This guy has a character arc. A goon who wants to prove himself to Silco is given the opportunity. Ready to rise to the surface. You know, it's so nice to see how this show integrated all sorts of representations. I mean, look at this. They've even included your average Toxic League player. <laughs> very nice, very nice. By taking a serum of shimmer, some toxin that boosts you into a beast-like form. A last minute muscular upgrade. And he does so, becoming yet another foe for Vi to beat, but a much more intimidating one. He's even lens aberrating everywhere. <laughs> as Powder continues to spectate from her window. Concerned to see this disadvantageous event unfold, and understandably so, as Vi's been fatigued out, and even with a slow-mo piece of flair, it ends terribly for her. Vi! As all seems lost in the moment, the tables have turned. So now, things are looking dire enough for Powder to choose to take some action. With Vanda still locked in place and Vi clearly set up to lose, she rummages through her kit. But we're not actually going to see her for a while, as it's much more dramatic to linger on the bad news. As the gang successfully lock out the beast, but still have some locks and bricks to go through. But eventually, after yet another scene, this time a little less brief of the progression of Hex Tech's successes, we return to Powder, the gang's last hope. It's those arcane cores she grabbed from the start of episode 1. Not quite sure of their full prowess, but we know they're explosive. And we just established they can be manipulated for good to fuel an entire society going forwards. Now jammed into a simple clapping monkey as a freshly fueled grenade. All the while that beast boy is ramming against the door. From Powder's perspective, this is the end of the line, as she has no idea what's happening on the other side. They're simply cornered as far as she knows. It's up to her to save them. You have to work for me, okay? And in a moment of emotion and innocence, Powder even leans against the toy for a hint of affection between the two of them. It's kind of sweet. And the drama continues from all the views. Bricks revealing, lockpicks spinning, bolts unhinging, Silco staring. It's all happening at once as a battle of endurance at this point. All against Powder's winding until she can finally contribute with... following down the windowsill to focus on our new subject, the remnant of Powder's hopes and dreams here, armed with an arcane core in the middle of its spiked symbols. And so it all escalates from there, the music rising more and more in suspense as the beats of Beast Boy's fists in the door drive the intensity. Powder holds her ears in preparation for the blast, though at the same time it's a go-to reflection of someone with voices in their heads too, just wanting some peace of mind in their unrelenting talkative one. Each clank of the core making it glow more and more blue residue until it finally reaches its destination, actually influencing the turn of events, being noticed by the Beast Boy for the first time, and unbeknownst to Powder, it's unneeded. Stopping the immediate danger, but just as Milo releases Vanda's chains and Klagor breaks through a new exit, and Vanda finally starts to even the playing field, and yet... The explosion is bigger than intended, playing with a fire we don't fully comprehend No, we're not counting that example! But in highlighting the intensity, emphasis is first placed on the final click of the winder. The final nail in the coffin against all of the other clickety clacks it's done. Followed by a low angle on the tiny toy to make it massive, briefly silhouetting it like this once the white energy over encumbers it. Then a close up right into the core as it destabilizes, another white out shot for a single frame here, and then a wide out top down view to show the explosion in size against the hallway. Beast Boy practically vanished, before trailing far out towards Powder to make that tower full link hit and slowing her down to slow-mo for a final piece of drama intensity. Everybody knows explosions have to be in slow-mo, it's just the rules! But what Arcane does next is really interesting. Thanks for reaching halfway through! Subscribe if you're invested this far in. You'll also be able to catch the Back to the Future video game streams we're doing on this channel, if you do. Covering a pseudo-canon afterstory from the film, so come join! Or see our other links in the link tree down below. The interesting thing that Arcane does is it shows us that final click once again. 
Now, I've seen some people interpret this as the toy smacking a second arcane core, which to be fair, we do see Powder place in two, and she does canonically have three, at least she did during the bedroom freakout. But considering the toy probably destroyed itself, I think instead the show was doing an extra funky flair by reversing back to the same moment to show a different direction and perspective. The explosion's just bigger because there are multiple cores in there. Anyway, this time, same opener, same low angle, same close up, but this time we stick down to the ground from the other side of Beast Boy rather than up top, where we now see a more vertical smoke trail, lightning spewing in all directions, and an extra flare on the door, as that's the direction Beast Boy is flung from. Harder to tell from the bird's eye view. And along another hallway do the vaults of energy go now, heading straight to Silco this time, to which he's saved by... whatever her name is. A shock face, a wide dive, and then, really cool here, a slow-mo backside shot with a dark background, a couple of flashes of light, and you can specifically see her arm disintegrating in the blast as Silco is pushed to safety behind the door frame. Wow, someone put a lot of care into this shot, and you've always got to appreciate it where you can. <laughs> From there, we next get an explanation for that next unused core. It was just flung out from the initial blast to cause a second blast, hitting this super low angle floor to actually keep it in shot, and then a low angle from the floor below to bring us down to our next important location as a single flare catches a trail on this lower level, igniting it for our camera to pan along, engulfing all the more chemicals because this blast had a long checklist to tick off and it really wanted to go for it, before we get this hallway shot into the end room 2D, hand-drawn fire animation inflaming the forefront and running up to our immoral scientist right up to the face for one more casualty. The decimation of the entire biotechnical lab of Silcos. We're not really feeling too bad for this guy from what we've seen over the last three episodes. A hit for Powder and a hit for Silco. Sounds like a roaring success of an assistive assault. And now this kid has a kill count. Time to return to her. Still falling in slow-mo since all these events are taking place in the same microsecond. In the time it took for Baby's first murder, she has barely fallen any distance. Surrounded by the chaotic blue. And then, it starts again. This time from yet another angle of Beast Boy, but more importantly... So that's why the door exploded from the prior shot. I don't know how quick your reflexes are meant to be to notice that the first time round and have time to ask the question about it before this reveal, but for this shot-by-shot -shot breakdown, it's a great little attention to detail. I guess it's for the replayers like me. Thanks. I always thought this was just a shard of the core or something piercing the keyhole, but no, that's a whole core. With a power so intense and fast, you can see the vaults jumping off of it and moving despite everyone else practically frozen. All three cores are being used here, and it's because of the overcompensation powder put in that there's any real kill count going on at all here. A reasonable dose of one core would have done the trick against the immediate danger. Huh. Nevertheless, it pierced, and in doing so is the bad news none of us wanted or expected. Taken out instantly from just the blast of energy, splattering his goggles as they float, suspended in time. Kind of a classic way to present a death more tastefully, but always impactful when it does. Followed by an actual impact of Klagor's body hitting the wall opposite, lifeless instantly. Perhaps a mercy, all things considered, since... Milo gets an even worse fate. Also blasted by that same surge of energy, yet not to a lethal degree. Instead, it's the knockback that gets him with a pipe thrust through his gut. Perhaps a piece of the door that plinked off earlier? Whatever the case, it's the look he gives that's really gut-wrenching, as he's self-aware enough to recognize the passing of his adoptive brother in the moment. It's so quick, but it's such a moment of despair, right before the roof above him comes to take him out too. Us now as the debris to crash into his face and cut to black. Oh, brutal. All that passes after just a little bit of extra time. Powder still falling in the moment, almost angelic. Finding a kind of solace in the madness, as it's both a beautiful display of blue and the start of a hobby in explosives. Oblivious to the disaster that's taken place, and yet oh so fitting of the person she's about to become. 
And one more time, lighting up the night sky and catching the eye of Marcus, the corrupted forzer who's been making deals with Silco behind closed doors. It's not much more to add, but it shows more of the scale of that explosion against a grey skyline, with a simple pull-in to show his intrigue. And now it's time for reality to kick in as the aftermath unfolds in front of us. Powder now disappears for 6 minutes of the runtime, as everyone else has to deal with their final character arcs. Beast Boy survived, Vander rolls out to dole some punches, Vi is crushed under metal, Vander is smacked down, it's all awful. And what's more... Vi, in catching a glimpse of the corpses, catches sight of Powder's influence too. It's an explanation of the worst kind. Meanwhile, Vander... Oh, it cuts out the music on his stabbing. The emotion's only going harder as he and Silco take their final moves against each other, and Silco wins, shattering Vander into the serum as they hunt for Vi now. But it's not over yet, as Vander has one last move in his final breaths in a beastly bio-arcane form. It's a hero's final solution, but a tragic way to die. Killing Beast Boy via exploding his head, and finally diving Vi out to safety against the burning building. As Silco lives another day. And now, finally, Vander is dead, with his heart beating out loud on street level. And giving his final words. Take care of Powder. <laughs> And ending us with our final Vander shot, dead on the streets, ballooned into his beastly form as the camera pulls up from its bird's eye view, twirling away as Vi grieves. A sorrow looking sight for an untimely death, or maybe his moral spirit reaching to higher planes. Whatever the spiritual nature of the arcane universe, there's still that major thread yet to be addressed in the most tear jerking of ways. Vi worked! My monkey bomb finally worked! In the middle of Vi standing and mourning her adoptive father, she just appears in the background, tiny and harmless, oblivious to everything else that has gone down. She's cast as a hint of colour in this dreary world, whilst Vi is backlit in flames, knowledgeable of all the awful context. You did this? Vi shown so much more close up thanks to the intensity of her words, whilst Powder is taken aback, unaware and conflicted, a child being scolded and backpedalling without any context. Why? And now she finally sees it, eyeline matching to where she's looking down, we can now see Vanda dead in the forefront, glowing an orange against the bluish backdrop, and the fire's so hot you can actually see some heat lines refracting some of the light in front of him. An extra sprinkle of good animation to simulate in this well done CGI land. And for the first time, Powder is involved with a shot of the fire as an unmoving silhouette against it, a role that's often placed for someone who intentionally lit the fire and relishes in its destruction. Ominous. Hid, hidden. I was saving you. And now it's the realization, trying to justify their original intentions as it was only meant as assistance, and the anxiety of it all starting to creep up on her, right as she spots Clagor's goggles, another somewhat corpse that she's involved with. I only wanted to help. I only wanted to help. I, only I told you to stay away. It's a naturally induced breakdown, now going for the bargaining stage of grief, and Powder doesn't know what else to say. She can only repeat her intentions, however manically, with all sorts of squashing and stretching on her head as she cries. I told you to stay away! Ah! No! Why did you leave me? Oh man, this is just awful. I don't know if that's makeup or meant to be dirt, but it is streaming down Powder's face and the hit is just the worst of it. You can even see the liquid flinging off her face from the impact. And you know it hurts since throwing hands is entirely Vi's thing. Knocked down in the face of the fire. Cause you're a jinx! Do you hear me? Milo was right! No, no, no. And it just continues, grabbed by the jaw in the most belittling way. Squeezing her so hard as the effect of that hit is blood starting to come out of her nose, and saying the very worst things Powder could stand to hear. We already know her insecurities centre around Milo's bullying and being a jinx, and at times it felt like only Vi was ever on her side. But now even she is saying it. Her worst realities are coming true, added on to the fact that she's confirmed at least two kills on her friends. <laughs> Me
Meanwhile, Vi is at a point of reflection, catching Powder's blood on her palm and much of her own from her fists fight earlier. She didn't want this to happen. This is not how things were supposed to go. <laughs> And now it's the depression stage. Tears literally from Vi as well as symbolically as the rain pitters on Klagor's goggles. All to leave Jinx to herself. Up high to see how small she is in this world that's dark and dangerous and deadly. It's the final moment between sisters and one that will define Jinx for years to come. By the way, this was crazy to hear, but did you know the voice actor for Jinx? <laughs> was only 11 years old at the time of recording? Mia Sinclair Jeunesse, incredible actor. I got the job when I was 10. Um, I turned 11 while I was working and now I'm gonna be 16 in December. And so Powder is left behind, left begging against this tragic backdrop. The camera pulling away from her too as Vi goes through it alone, washing her hands of blood. Just one more beat of misfortune to really twist the knife for us audience as... <laughs> Appearing from that same spot as Powder and Focus pulling on him. It's one more worst case scenario. Silco. He stands ominously tall against that evil blue lightning as Powder crumbles to her lowest point, drenched, inflamed, and emotionally broken. Silco is searching for Vi right now, but this is a good alternative. Originally planning to kill, as hinted by this knife shot, but just before Vi can intercept this dark looking finale scene, there's one more kick down. <laughs> I'll kill you if he hears you. It's Marcus, that enforcer from before, coming to take Vi to safety and also assist Silco in the moment. He'll be bribing wardens now to keep Vi locked away for longer. The final tragic point of this sequence, as her view becomes unstable and blurred from the chloroform. Clinking of the jar echoing as she loses consciousness, drifting into the void that is the very tunnel we started from. And as for Jinx... <laughs> She left me. She just needs comfort in this moment, regardless of who it's from, like an imprinting duckling. Diving Silco's knife away as the cohorts stand judgingly. And what drives Silco to reciprocate? Malice. She is not my sister anymore. Eyeline matching to Vander's corpse as Silco recognizes it, knowing this is the perfect middle finger to the guy by manipulating his adoptive daughter. The hand that's killed so many before, now used as a source of affection. All the while Powder is severing herself from the family too. It's a perfect mixture of consequences, and the end of the peaceful era. We will show them all. Powder is dead, Jinx is born. Angry, sad, broken, villainous. And we end with this powerful wide of the fire pit. Now Vando barely recognized as Silco sits in the group surrounds. Born anew on top of his death, the last beacon of life in the center of this dark, dark alleyway. Jumping briefly to wider out with a focus adjustment as the camera pulls back further and further into the tunnel. Endlessly stretched out to bottle the scene into a single shape, like a contained snow globe. Twisting away as it dips into the void to show the unease that will follow, as this night will have impact for years to come going forwards. The song now coming to the forefront. Goodbye. It's time to say goodbye. Where is my home? I don't recognize the faces anymore. No. Where is my friend? The one I've known since I was only just a kid. It is Powder's song as she turns in this twisted world. Clearly, the scene that changed Arcane for diverting the entire narrative in the way that is compelling, satisfying and heartbreaking with so many moving parts that contribute to making it just that more tragic what an absolute masterpiece arcane is i cannot wait to see what more comes either of this franchise since of course it has been renewed let's just hope it's not another six years wait this time <sighs> you know this council room is really starting to grow on me and obviously like i, I love the cast of characters we've got around this table it's really interesting to see the different designs and personalities it's just all really growing on me you know <sighs> i sure hope nothing bad happens to anyone in this room for now my name's been daz you didn't really care and i'll see you in a bit